Stanford University. And the next one I have is about food policy. This is really exciting. We've got Supervisor Yeager, who got his PhD in education here. Welcome back to Stanford, Ken Yeager. And he's going to be followed by Abby King. Oh, who took the clicker with them? You've got to give the clicker back. Sorry about that. Great. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's always good to be back here at Stanford. Um, I have to go very quickly, but my hope at the end of all of this is that I've made you all junk food warriors, because I think it is all within our power to actually change a lot of the meals and a lot of the food that we see in our daily lives. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I've been able to do at the County of Santa Clara. Uh, people often ask me why I do what I do, and I truly believe that one of the greatest gifts we can give to anyone is the gift of health. And if you're healthy, you can, you know, strive, you can try to improve yourself, you can be happier, uh, you can reach your goals, but when you have chronic illnesses, it's almost impossible to do that because you, you're so focused on your health. And so as a policymaker, as an elected official, I have it as one of the things that I want to accomplish is again to provide the gift of health to as many people as I can. Uh, we are in Santa Clara County here. We're at the northern um, edge. Uh, we have great universities here. We have great cities. Um, but the unincorporated area, which Stanford is a part of, is the area that the county, county government, has um, authority over when it comes to land use. And so when we talk about a lot of the policies at the county, we're only talking about the unincorporated areas, not the incorporated areas like Palo Alto or San Jose. Uh, in um, Santa Clara County, as many of you probably already know, um, the issue of uh, obesity is a huge health problem here. Overall, more than half of our adults are either overweight or obese, and even more disturbing to me as a policymaker is uh, in certain uh, communities, like the African American community and the Latino community, it is 68%. And this is such an, a disturbing health inequality to me that these are often low-income people in these populations, minority populations, and what we're doing to their health is, is just an, an outrage. And again, part of what I try to do is to try to correct that health inequity. It's a problem with our youth as well. One in four of our youth are either overweight or obese. These numbers continue to grow. And again, very worried about their health as they get older. Uh, we all know what many of the health consequences are of obesity. I've just listed as many as I could here, but a severe, severe health issue, particularly when you go into more chronic uh, diseases like diabetes. The cost of uh, obesity is very high. Um, in Santa Clara County, it's been estimated uh, in 2006 that it was $2.1 billion. A lot of this is because of health care costs and the loss of productivity. Uh, don't be fooled, the, the muscle of the food industry is, is very strong. Um, it's been interesting for me as a policymaker at the local level to sort of be confronted with that muscle, but we're, we're talking the big boys and girls here. Uh, the food and uh, beverage industry, $1.5 trillion. This is not your local farmer, this is the industry itself. Uh, $2 billion a year in marketing directly to children. Uh, millions of dollars that go into advertising and to lobbying, and um, often they can find a way to protect um, their marketing through First Amendment speech rights. This is uh, an ad that we uh, are beginning to do here in Santa Clara County. One thing that just drives me crazy when it comes to health issues is that often the message is so timid, nobody understands that there's a big problem here. It's sort of like, well, eat your fruits and vegetables, as if, okay, well, that's going to take care of the obesity problem. So I really stress with our public health department, keep those messages strong to wake up people. And so here we have, our kids are drowning in sugar. We were not allowed to say our kids are drowning in soda because you can't sort of disparage a product or a brand. And if you do that, then you're going to get the uh, uh, big food down on you to try to get you to change that. Um, we're going to see if we can keep this message, but even that, there's been a lot of criticism of it 
by big food. Um, recent, um, some food uh, industry wins, um, the fact that they were able to defeat a federal soda tax several years ago means they're taking this very seriously. As you might well know, pizza and, and french fries are now a vegetable in uh, the new school lunch uh, standards. And uh, they are trying a very, you know, effectively to defeat stricter voluntary guidelines for marketing to children. So progress has been very slow. For something where an issue where everybody knows what the problem is, trying to get victories is very hard. And so I, at the local level, am really determined to do whatever I can um, in the area that I have control over. You know, I can't deal with state legislation and federal. Awfully hard to get new policies passed there, but there are certain things that I can do at the local level. Um, there are five of us on the Board of Supervisors, so in theory, all I need is two more votes, and I can really have a lot of fun. And so that's what I've been trying to do. And so very briefly, I'm going to talk about our kids' meal ordinance. Um, Santa Clara County was the first um, jurisdiction to restrict uh, giving uh, toys away to, uh, on children's meals that don't meet certain nutritional standards. Um, it all happened very quickly. I became uh, president of the Board of Supervisors in January 2010. I figured, well, as long as I'm going to become president of the board, I might as well do something. Focused very much on children's health and introduced this uh, ordinance, uh, again, to restrict uh, the toy giveaways. And by August of the same year, we had passed it. Um, I also figured um, that uh, as long as I was going to be in this position, again, might as well do something, because why else have a little bit of power if you're not going to use it? Um, the overview quickly is that restaurants may not provide a toy with meals that contain certain kind of requirements. As you know, a lot of these meals that are marketed to kids are well over half of the caloric intake that they need uh, all day long. Here we sort of restrict it, and then there's penalties for any um, fast food chain that uh, doesn't follow it. Uh, numerous arguments against it that you've all heard before. It's a nanny state. Uh, it's not the toys that cause obesity. You know, we heard them over and over. These were some of the um, advertisements that were put in the uh, local newspaper uh, prior to the vote on this. I particularly like this one. I don't know why. Tough on crime. And here you have this sweet girl uh, in handcuffs um, with, uh, with her toy doll here uh, behind her. And who made the uh, politicians the toy uh, police? Ken Yeager has a big idea, make it illegal to include toys with kids' restaurants. Um, and then a lot of media coverage, which was a lot of fun, I have to tell you. Um, you know, I'd never been on CNN and Fox and all of that. So, but anyway, people were very interested in all of this and a lot of local attention as well. And every time I had to do it, and of course there was always people from the restaurant industry uh, countering everything I said. I mean, my feeling was whenever I can talk about children's health and the meals that we're feeding them, um, that that was a good day. Whenever we can get that message out. A little bit of a ripple effect. Uh, maybe I thought there was going to be a little bit more, but uh, the great city of San Francisco uh, passed a similar ordinance, which was great. And we just heard about a month ago uh, that the country of Chile uh, adopted it as well. And then there's um, a variety of other uh, jurisdictions that have done it. But what's interesting, um, there have been some states like Arizona and Florida that have actually passed laws preempting any local jurisdiction from restricting toys being given away in children's meals. So again, this industry knows what it's doing. Um, and change happens one meal at a time. Again, it's hard to sort of change eating the habits of everyone, and, and I can't do that. I can't change the world, but if I can change one meal at a time collectively, maybe it will begin to make a difference. And so what the other thing we did recently here, and, and I'm really proud of this, we have now sort of the toughest comprehensive nutritional standards of any jurisdiction in the United States. You know, I was thinking about this, and again, it's, it's really the, the message I want to give. You have more authority and more power than you realize, but you just have to think about it. You just have to say, now what can I change? And I was thinking that as a county supervisor, we are in charge of the jails. We're in charge of juvenile hall and all the uh, juvenile detention centers. We have a hospital. We have clinics. Um, we have cafeterias. And there's no reason why we can't change the food that is served in each and every one of those facilities as a way to sort of make it an education moment for all of those people who are receiving those meals. And so our new policy, it's just really great. 
um, we serve four million meals annually in our, um, in our jails, 500,000 meals to kids, uh, 1.2 million meals uh, to seniors, all of the meals in the hospital, and then all the things that we have with the vending machines and whatever. And so these now are very comprehensive policies. None of these folks that when these meals are served can get a sugary drink. They're forbidden to get sugary drinks. We've lowered the, uh, the, the portion size, the amount of sugar, the amount of, of, of salt, sodium, and how they're cooked. And we're sort of urging then for whole grades and locally grown produce. Um, the other thing that I'm on an organization called First Five, um, which is a, a great organization that works with kids zero to five. And I serve on that. And I also know that they fund many childcare centers uh, throughout the county. And I said to myself, well, what kind of food are they serving in these childcare centers? And so what I had First Five do, because they do contracts with these organizations, I said, let's put it in the contract that they need to meet certain nutritional standards in all the meals that they serve to these kids or they no longer get the funding from First Five. And First Five said, great, they changed the contract, and now you see all these different organizations that now have new and better nutritional standards. Um, just, this is my last story because my time is, uh, I have eight seconds. Um, the Children's Discovery Museum, if you've ever been to it, it's great. It's uh, in downtown San Jose, and it's all these programs that are aimed for, uh, for kids. And they were having a, you know, I know there's the Rethink Your Drink that they were handing out, and they had this big program at the beginning of the summer, sort of free summer, that I was at and I spoke. And then I went downstairs to their cafeteria. Um, just to see what it was like. And I tell you, it just, it was a real wake up. They had the big soda machine, you know, with, you know, in the big gulp. And next to that, it was the pizza. And next to that, it was all of the chips and, and the candy bars. And I said, what's going on here? Here we're promoting Rethink Your Drink. And these kids come down here and all they do is get this junk. And so then the, you know, I talked to the director and it, a, a wonderful woman um, and who was very much embarrassed because she never really had looked at it. And then as they were trying to sort of restrict the soda that they put out for the kids and whatever, they get the pushback, well, we're losing too much money. We make too much money off of junk, which is why you see the junk food everywhere. And so, but she really was committed to do this change. And so she was able to get um, money from First Five and the Health Trust to subsidize the Children's Discovery Museum for the loss of revenue from that, from no longer selling that food. And we hope then to do a whole assessment as a business model about how we can change this so people can get the junk food out and it still is economically viable. And for people who are doing research, I think this would be a great research project to uh, get a better handle on. So anyway, just think about your own backyard, soda, junk, and all of the vending machines. I any counter you go to, it's all the junk. You go to the cafeterias, it's all the junk. And I would just really encourage you to speak out, to say, please don't do this, or give us healthier choices, or do you really have to have the junk there right by the, uh, the register? And if you don't really know what a big battle is in front of you, you certainly will when you hear back about all the reasons why we can't change it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Fabulous. Can give that to Arthur Hill. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, now you know why Michael Bloomberg is called the Ken Yeager of the East. Okay? Next we have Abby King to follow up with the research perspective. Abby's one of my favorite colleagues from the Stanford Prevention Research Center. Forward, back, pointer. <laughs> and she's gonna tell you about some research that's been done on Ken's legislation. All yours, Abby. Thank you so much. Ken, that was phenomenal. That was really wonderful. Christopher started this morning by t saying how, how blessed we are to live here in the Bay Area. And I have to say, after big game and the World Series contender that's having this week, life is really good, isn't it, here in the Bay Area? Um, but I think those of us at the Stanford Prevention Research Center feel particularly blessed to be in a county that is hands down the most progressive board of supervisors in any county in the US. And I would just like to have us give Ken another round of applause.
so what I'm here to talk about today is really how can we grow our relationships between our incredible policymakers on the one hand and the research and academic environment on the other hand. And I'd like to start out by really showcasing our hero at SPRC in this, who's Jennifer Otten, who is a postdoctoral fellow who's been with us for a few years. And Jen has really been the stalwart in terms of helping SPRC move our own research agenda to the policy arena. And in fact, Jen has become so accomplished and so popular that she's right now at an invited health policy training in Washington, DC, so she couldn't be here today. Um, but I, I pass along her regards. And what, what I'm going to be presenting today is really mostly her research. She's the heart and soul of this, and I'd like to start by telling how our story began as researchers. How, how did we get involved in thinking about policy research? And we started by just reading our local paper, and I think for anybody who's interested in what's happening locally in terms of the policy arena and where we might be able to find win-wins, I think reading your local paper is a great place to start. So I, I was reading the paper, um, over breakfast one day, and I saw this impending Santa Clara County legislation that was coming down the pike. And we thought, what a great opportunity for a potential natural experiment if we could get the stars to align. So we called together interested SPRC researchers. We met. We talked about it. We looked for funding because, of course, our Achilles heel is to try to find quick funding to be able to support our research. And so we applied for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Rapid Response Funding Pool, which is set up exactly for this kind of thing. Quick acting policies that are happening that they will seed with funding. And lo and behold, the stars aligned, and we were able to get funding to actually study this incredible natural experiment that was unfolding right in our own backyard. And so to capture the impacts, what we did was a pre-ordinance, post-ordinance comparison of chains that were within the ordinance and in, in the unincorporated parts of Santa Clara County versus nearby demographically matched chain specific restaurants that were right down the road but were outside of the ordinance area. So this is what we call a natural experiment. And we were able to, to capture both direct observation and assess the, res the restaurant responses as well as field surveys to measure customer responses before and after the legislation. And this is where Jen Otten and her stalwart gang of undergraduate students from Stanford went out to these restaurants. She's got some very hair-raising stories to tell about that. I think at one point we actually, Christopher went in as an undercover agent with his child because we needed certain information that we couldn't get unless you were a customer. And so he gave up his third born by going into the restaurant and, and having them purchase something, I seem to recall. Um, so here's the data. So you can see at pre-ordinance, let me see, I don't dare try to find the, okay, whew, I'll stand over here. Um, at pre-ordinance, there really was no difference in terms of the restaurants, as you might expect, that were in or outside of the ordinance area. But by um, immediately after the ordinance, you can see that actually the restaurants in the ordinance district actually made some changes. And those changes which were quickly made because they only had three months really to come online. And in fact, I think that was a blessing that they didn't have a lot of time to push back, that it, it happened quickly and rapidly and they had to respond. But as you can see, immediately after the ordinance at the end of August, and the ordinance came into effect August 9th, 
that um, an increase in the presence of healthy choices, better nutritional guidelines and information, and less toy marketing and advertising. And you can see that this continued um, four months post-implementation, and Jen actually has collected some 12-month data as well to show that, that it's continuing. And just to give you a flavor of what some of the different chains did, here's the Burger King pre-policy uh, information that, that was in their restaurant. And then four months post, they actually broke their, rest, their information out into two menus. And you can see the top menu it are all of the meals that actually met the ordinance. And uh, they also um, dropped then the food that wasn't meeting the ordinance down below. And they charged um, families about 99 cents if you wanted the toy. So they actually did what we were hoping or th that they might do in actually trying to meet the ordinance. And they also put up a sign, an informational sign in front of the restaurant letting parents know what this was all about and how they were complying with the ordinance. Um, Taco Bell had a different take. So what was interesting, the four different restaurant chains did handle this ordinance in four different ways. So Taco Bell, you could see the pre-ordinance where they had um, their kid advertising, and then four months post-ordinance, they actually removed their toy advertising, and they actually dropped the cost of the meal because they were no longer passing along that cost of the, of the toy to the families. Um, Jack in the Box, pre-ordinance, had their Curious George game going and some other things going. Um, by six to 12 months post-test, they had completely removed the toys and had been advertising their healthier option, which was apples. And finally, Subway. Uh, by six to 12 months post, Subway had reduced the sodium in their deli meats, and, and most of their kid meals actually met the legislative criteria. So in conclusion, this kind of policy really seems to have a positive impact on food environments when the restaurants go for it and don't try to do an end run around it, which is what we're seeing up in San Francisco. So um, this kind of research helps us to increase our evidence base. Jen helped to get the word out with this kind of research. She presented it at national meetings. There were a lot of journal articles. A lot of media picked it up on the science side. So here we're working at two different ends. The policy side and the science side can work together to really hopefully double the kind of messaging that we can get out. And obviously, this serves as model legislation. And it was so exciting to hear, Ken, about what's happening at the Discovery Museum. And it's just those kinds of things that we need to hear from our policy people who are local to say, here, we, we have these things going on. What can you scientists do to help us so that we can really evaluate to understand what works, what can be tweaked, and then if it works, how can we get it disseminated? So I think the take home points are obviously the partnerships between policymakers, researchers, and I added funders, because we would not have been able to do this research without funding. And that's something that we have to continue to figure out. But obviously, this can be a win-win. And the major question, and I hope we can have some great discussions about this as we go throughout the day, is how can we grow these partnerships to benefit the public health? Thanks very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.